introductory lecture and my lectures on Byzantine art. I talked briefly about the demise of the Western Roman Empire. Today we will look, again all too briefly, at the kingdoms that replaced it. Basically, the Franks settled in what today is northern France and western Germany. The Visigoths settled in what today is Spain. The Ostrogoths and then the Lombards took over Italy. And the Saxons moved into northern Germany and then to England. In other words, this was a period of great migrations. And the art these groups produced, at least in their early days, is often lumped together under the term migratory art. So what kind of art does one, can one, produce when constantly on the move? The answer is art that is highly portable. Your reading referred to articles such as these as status symbols, small precious items that proclaim their wearer's wealth and social status and also reveal the rather extraordinary craftsmanship of the time. Fibulae were used to fasten garments. Notice the rather spectacular fibula that Justinian wears in the famous San Vitale mosaic. The characteristic fibula design combined elaborate geometric forms with zoomorphic or animal-based images. Filigree refers to the patterns formed with gold or silver wire. Now the work on the left used to show up all the time on the AP exam. The work on the right the Merovingian fibula is now one of our required works, but even though the purse cover has dropped off the list, I could imagine it showing up as part of an attribution question that asks you to identify it as migratory art or as Hiberno-Saxon art. Now, just because I find this so interesting, here's a picture of the Anglo-Saxon site in England where the purse cover was found in the 1930s. It was under a mound of dirt on somebody's farm. When the archaeologists dug down, they found a ship that had been used as the burial site. If you're interested, there's a fun Khan Academy po podcast about the Sutton Hoo burial site, and I'll put it up on Moodle. So here are close-ups of the animal figures on the purse cover, as well as some of the vocabulary you need to know to analyze migratory art and Hiberno-Saxon art. Hiberno means Irish, by the way. Stay tuned. And by the way, in the past, the College Board has not accepted just medieval for attribution. You need to say Hiberno-Saxon or Irish-Saxon. Zoomorphic, then, is just what it sounds like in the form of animals. The animal shapes on the purse cover here are really intriguingly bizarre. You have two wolves either whispering secrets to the man in between or maybe taking a nibble on his ears. Then you see what looks like an eagle embracing or is it devouring a duck? We can only guess at the significance of these symbols. Cloisonne refers to patterns formed by soldering thin metal wire to a metal backing and then filling the spaces with precious stones, glass, or glass paste or enamel that's fired to look like jewels. The eagle heads and fish of our required work aren't as wonderfully weird, but they are still zoomorphic. We also see cloisonne, which literally means partitioned in French. In this case, the jewels and enameled glass are separated by thin silver wire. The red zone in the eagle's eyes is a garnet. The elaborate knot patterns of the metal are known as interlace, and we'll see more of this in a moment when we turn to Celtic illuminated manuscripts. So what might be the religious significance of the eagle and the fish? We're not absolutely certain that this was a Christian uh, work of art, but probably it was. The fish was a traditional Christian symbol. Christ promised to make his disciples fishers of men, after all. And the eagle was the traditional attribute or symbol associated with the Gospel of John. The Frankish king Clovis, who was a ruler in the Merovingian Frankish dynasty, converted to Christianity in 496, as we see in the ivory on the right. Note that there appears to be an eagle in this work as well. So the eagle is a traditional royal as well as a Christian symbol. At any rate, the zoomorphic patterns, cloisonne and interlace, were all carryovers from pre-Christian migratory art. So here are two more uh, interesting examples of interlace, though again, this is not a required work. The tradition of elaborate wood carving carried over in Viking art, even as the Norsemen embraced Christianity around the year 1000. The highly stylized, abstract animals are interwoven with extraordinarily delicate carvings of plant tendrils. I love this. So what Muslim artistic element does this remind you of? Maybe arabesques? <clears throat> 
While the Romans were retreating from the British Isles long before they abandoned Gaul or Germany, it was rather ironically Irish and British monks who brought Christianity to the Franks and Saxons, and Irish and British monks who preserved literacy and Latin language and texts, even as literacy was declining in Western Europe during the Dark Ages. Now, there was a very popular book a few years ago entitled How the Irish Saved Civilization. Actually, one could say the Byzantines saved civilization as well. If anything, they preserved more ancient texts. But the most characteristic artwork of the Hiberno-Saxons, the Celts and Anglo-Saxons of the British Isles, were the illuminated or illustrated manuscripts of texts painstakingly copied in monastery scriptoria. Our required work was produced in one of the most famous of these Hiberno-Saxon monasteries, Lindisfarne, on the coast of Northumbria in northern England. The map, by the way, shows the Viking invasions, including one that destroyed the original monastery in 793. The Lindisfarne Gospels were probably created by an artist monk living in Northumbria in the early 700s, the very heart, again, of what the historians call the Dark Ages, because these were not good times, usually, at least not in Europe. Usually, medieval manuscripts were produced by a team of scribes and illustrators. The Lindisfarne Gospels are thought to have been created by one man, a monk named Edfrith, Bishop of Lindisfarne between 698 and 720, 721. I was interested that the college board does not list him as the artist, so I looked it up, and apparently the attribution to Edfrith is disputed by some art historians, so the college board's probably playing it safe. Anyway, each gospel opened with a portrait, a painting of the gospel's evangelist, followed by an intricately woven cross-carpet page. So how do we know this is Luke? Well, it's Luke's gospel that comes after this page, which makes it easy, but you should also recognize his attribute, the ox, in this case, equipped rather unrealistically with wings. So here's Matthew. Now, this portrait page isn't required, but I find it actually even more interesting. This Matthew is posing rather like a classical philosopher with his traditional beard. And again, remember, it was these Hiberno-Saxon monks who were keeping classical traditions partly alive. There are even a few attempts at perspective. Note the shape of the footstool, for example. On the other hand, the drapery is portrayed flat without realistic volume, and we don't see much evidence that Matthew has a real body underneath his stylized cloak. His attribute is a man or an angel. It's a little hard to tell since the other attribute animals also tend to sport wings. Note again the attributes associated with the other evangelists, the lion for Mark, in this case, of course, a winged lion, and the eagle for St. John. I find it intriguing that animals as well as evangelists are sporting halos. And here's the cross carpet page from the Gospel of Matthew. It comes directly after the portrait page. Note the persistence of interlace and geometric forms. In form, this is very similar to the cloisonne we saw in the purse cover and the Merovingian fibula. A close-up also reveals zoomorphic forms caught up in the elaborate interlace. Below is another close-up, this time from the Book of John's cross-carpet page. Now, these are known as carpet pages because they resemble oriental rugs. We have no reason to think they were called that at the time. This may have been intentional, using this kind of a pattern in the books, that is. Historical sources tell us that prayer mats were known in Northumbria at this time, and they were used in other Christian and Islamic lands. Coptic Gospels from Egypt also include cross-carpet pages. Prayer mats, of course, are put down to help prepare worshipers for prayer and to signify that they are on holy ground, which makes it a fitting introduction to a gospel. So here are two other cross-carpet pages from the Lindisfarne Gospels. Each carpet page contained a different form of the cross, again, suggesting that Lindisfarne was a gathering place for Christian scholars from a variety of traditions. The insipid or opening page of each gospel shows the first letters elaborated again with those interlacing and spiral patterns, strongly influenced by Anglo-Saxon jewelry and enamel work. Although spirals also tended to have religious connotations, actually many traditions signifying eternity. The distinctive script takes elements from many different cultures. There are Roman capitals, 
Greek characters and angular letters recalling Germanic runes or symbols. Again, this is kind of a cross-cultural work. The artist, whoever he was, employed an exceptionally wide range of colors using animals, vegetable, and mineral pigments. Okay, now I'm heading into a stretch of art history that the College Board has decided to drop altogether. I can't bear to, partly because this period is so important to world history as well as to art history. In short, and I have to be short, relations between the Pope in Rome and the Byzantine Empire were already strained in the years after Justinian. The Byzantines, who were struggling with Islamic invaders and the plague, were less able to protect Rome against the Germanic Lombards or even marauding North African pirates. The popes, meanwhile, condemned the iconoclasts in the Byzantine Empire and vigorously defended holy images. At any rate, the growing power of the Germanic Lombards in Italy led the popes to look for new protectors, and they found them in the Frankish kings. The earlier Merovingian dynasty, remember that fibula, was replaced by the Carolingians, a noble family that gained great credibility when Charles Martel held back a Muslim invasion of France. Our history would have been very different if he had not won the Battle of Tours. The Franks reached their high point under Charlemagne, who was crowned Holy Roman Emperor by the Pope in Rome on Christmas Day 800. Here you see two different maps of Charlemagne's empire and the surrounding empires. Both maps date to after Charlemagne's conquest of the Lombards. So neither of these is required, but they give you a good opportunity to see how classical styles changed in the medieval period, but were still influencing medieval art, especially in the Carolingian Renaissance, where there was a deliberate effort to revive classicism. So note that in both the Roman and medieval statue, the emperor is too big in comparison to the horse. This is a kind of hierarchy of scale. The horse is shown moving, and so is Marcus Aurelius, but Charles the Bald is calm and stately and unmoving. The Roman figures, man and horse, have clearly defined musculature and naturally flowing drapery. Charles the Bald is stylized and somewhat abstract. The recovery of classical style, oops, there we go, uh, shows up even more clearly in the Coronation Gospels, illuminated manuscripts that were produced with Charlemagne's patronage. Here the body returns, as does realistic drapery. This guy has knees. The artist doesn't just use line to create a sense of volume. We see shading, color, and light used to create three dimensions on a two-dimensional space. There's a landscape background and even Roman acanthus leaves. The comparison with this portrait from Pompeii on the right should further highlight the similarities. The Ebo Gospels, on the other hand, represent a very different artistic turn. Just as a personal story, uh, I was hosting a dinner party for a bunch of people, many of whom were professors at Stanford, admittedly law professors and not our history professors. So I showed them uh, this and a couple of other pictures from the Ebo Gospels and asked them to guess when they were painted. And they all assumed that they were uh, 20th century Christian works. Nope. This is the the Dark Ages, or at least the very beginning of the Higher Middle Ages. So the Ebo Gospels, uh, which used to be a popular college board image and which I really like, um, I think the frenzy style is rather cool. I have fallen off the course, but note that St. Matthew has a rather clearly defined body and he's casting a clear shadow. These are naturalistic elements that show, again, the Carolingian interest in classical styles. But the artist both employs and transforms the more line-based traditions of Northern art. The classical influence is clear in the drapery and naturalism. And here are a couple more from the Ebo Gospels. Oops, uh, St. John with his attribute, the eagle, uh, and St. Mark with his lion. Sorry, I must have messed up my slides there. but. We really need to move on. You already saw this church. Just as a reminder that another Charlemagne shout out to the Roman Empire was his royal chapel, modeled pretty clearly on San Vitale in the former Western Roman Empire capital of Ravenna. When Charlemagne died, he divided his empire among his three sons, following the inheritance tradition of the Franks, but really messing up his empire. Subsequent heirs would squabble over boundaries for the next 200 years, ultimately destroying the Carolingian Empire in the West. What would one day be France broke apart into a large number of feudal counties, ruled over by lords and their vassals. 
But in the East, a new line of Saxon rulers would reclaim the title of Holy Roman Emperor, starting with Otto I in 962. Again, this famous Atonian church is no longer required, but I don't want you to think that the more elaborate Romanesque and even more elaborate Gothic cathedrals that we're going to be studying the next two days just sprang up out of nowhere. Under the Atonians, church architecture remained basilican in form. Note that long rectangular nave, the flat timber roof. But Europe also saw a new trend toward adding towers and what were called west works, uh, face, you know, basically uh, multi-story additions on the west side of the church. And we'll see these again, especially in our Gothic required work, Chartres Cathedral. But here's the most famous element of St. Michael's Church. The abbot of this church was Otto III's tutor and a notable scholar. As a tutor, he had opportunities to travel to Rome and see some of the masterworks of classical and early Christian art, including the beautiful carved wooden doors of Santa Sabina. Now, bronze doors were fairly common in ancient Rome. The Pantheon, for example, had and still has bronze doors, although the doors you would see today date from the 15th century. Byzantine churches sometimes had bronze-plated doors, where bronze reliefs were cast and then attached to wooden doors. What's remarkable about these doors is that they were cast as a single piece using the lost wax casting me method. Remember that? So they represent a huge recovery of ancient technology. These were the first decorated bronze doors cast in one piece in all the West since Roman times. And that's why the College Board used to ask a lot of questions about this work. Sigh. So let's look closely at just one image from the doors, God presenting Eve to Adam. So what classical elements do you see? The drapery molding God's legs is very realistic, as are the legs. Does God have legs? We also see clear, if rather stylized, landscape elements. Notice, too, the highly expressive use of empty space, what's sometimes called negative space, the heavily charged distance uh, between Adam and Eve where they're coming together. Yep, I think dropping this work was a mistake, but moving right along, we caught only the briefest glimpse of the Vikings, but to compress a whole lot of interesting history into a sentence or two, some Vikings eventually settled down and established strong centralized states in Sicily and in Normandy in the northwest of France. In 1066, William the Duke of Normandy invaded and conquered England. Our final required work of the day, the Bayou Tapestry offers an extraordinary history of that invasion, a continuous narrative in 75 scenes explained with Latin inscriptions and rendered in wool yarn sewn onto linen cloth. So they weren't actually technically tapestries. We're going to see the whole story in just a minute, a wonderful animated video of the Bayou Tapestry, which records in minute and painstaking detail the Normans' invasion of England. The tapestry is actually even more important to military historians than it is to art historians. Much of what we know about medieval warfare comes from this tapestry. So here are just a few details. William the Conqueror's claim to the throne came through King Edward the Confessor. In the top panel, we see the hand of God pointing the way to Westminster Abbey, where Edward was buried. This is a claim to legitimacy on the part of William the Conqueror. We've seen that in art before. Here we see William's forces crossing the channel to claim the throne and we get a look at what uh, naval technology was like at the time. And here we see the Norman knights attacking the forces of the English King Harold. This image is one of the two required works from the Bayou Tapestry. Note that the main events of the story are contained in the larger middle zone. The upper and lower zones contain images of animals and people, scenes from Aesop's fables, scenes of farming and hunting. Now, winners tend to get to write the history. Note that the Norman knights are portrayed as larger, more powerful, really in many ways more heroic than the English infantry or foot soldiers. For all its value to historians, this work is still a work of political propaganda. Here we see Bishop Odo blessing a meal. I've circled him there. He was William the Conqueror's half-brother, and he's thought to have commissioned this work. So, no surprise, he got himself a starring role. As you're reading notes, we pick up a lot of information about life in medieval England from this tapestry, including details about how food was prepared. And we get some pretty graphic images of the carnage involved in medieval warfare. So let's watch the whole story. 
Well, I hope you have time to end with a quick comparison of these two works. Do you remember the work on top? You're just seeing a detail of it here. It's the mosaic of Alexander defeating Darius from around 100 BCE. You may also recall that it is a mosaic found in Pompeii, almost certainly based on an earlier and now lost Greek painting. So what's the obvious similarity aside from their both being battle scenes? What are the major differences? Well, these are both propaganda pieces. They record the victory of a conqueror, and frankly, they glorify that conqueror. Both are also important historical accounts of an actual event. But even though it's more than a thousand years older, the Greek mosaic shows more modeling. The bodies actually have real shape. Alexander's face is also much more expressive. Remember that this is Hellenistic art, uh, often highly emotional. Like most medieval art, the design of the Bayou Tapestry is highly linear, linear and rather flat. Still, the contorted heads and moving legs do suggest the influence of Roman and Greek battle scenes. So, did you enjoy the break from churches? Don't get too comfortable. It isn't going to last. <laughs>